he doesn't know what I'm going to talk about, so I'll tell you before we get started if I see a mass exodus after I describe it. I'll be disappointed. Uh, in the two talks today and tonight and tomorrow morning, I want to look at the uh, themes in Lewis that provide a uh, backdrop for thinking about law. Um, and uh, quote from some of his works, but also uh, look at the historical reasons why, some of the reasons why the framework of understanding about law that, that Lewis felt was necessary, not just for Christian people, but for all people, uh, why that framework has fallen out of favor and why um, uh, that is a great loss. And then I want to develop some theological reasons why uh, it really ought to be imperative for, for the church, first of all, to recover that kind of framework of thinking and not to try to do law or think about law and politics in a very ad hoc way, but just uh, in terms of issues. Uh, as I was preparing this, I was reminded of a, an observation in one of B.S. Naipaul's novels. I can't remember which one it is, where he refers to a woman uh, and Naipaul can, be, can really crisp someone, as my kids would say. Um, she had many opinions, but taken all together, they did not add up to a point of view. <laughs> um, Lewis had many opinions, but most importantly, he had a point of view. Uh, and uh, I think that it's not so much his opinions about particular political issues that, that we really need to imbibe, but that this, this grander point of view uh, that, that, that he was representing, which was, in fact, the point of view of the Christian West uh, for, for hundreds of years, a point of view which has been displaced and, uh, unfortunately, is in disrepair even uh, within the church. Um, uh, Steve mentioned some of the strengths of Lewis, the fact that he articulates things that we have, at some level, intuitively known. I, uh, Seven or eight years ago, I interviewed uh, the Lutheran ethicist Gilbert Mylander about Lewis. Mylander's written a lot about Lewis. And uh, he pointed out that he thought Lewis was a good apologist, in part not because he came up with, as many of us think, really good arguments to defend Christian truth, but he said that Lewis's real strength was he, he understood the ramifications of Christian living, and he described them really well. And he described what the world looked like from a Christian standpoint. Another way I've thought about Lewis's strengths, and only recently realized this, is that he saw the changes in Western culture that, that modernity has brought in, that modern culture brings in. But he saw them as an outsider to modernity, in a sense. And he, he made reference to this in 1954, I think it was, when he uh, accepted a chair in medieval and renaissance studies at Cambridge, that, uh, that he was really, a, he called himself a dinosaur. He was uh, someone who represented a way of looking at reality that was more at home in the 14th century than it was in the 20th. Um, and yet, he argued, and I would argue, that it ought to be a way of looking at reality that the church continues to sustain, um, not something that we, uh, that we uh, turn our backs on. Uh, Lewis was fond of ch ch chastising people for uh, their uh, tendency toward presentism, toward assuming that uh, the assumptions of our present moment, this would be, uh, 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 I don't know if he used the phrase or uh, uh, Richard Weaver, provincialism in time, uh, assuming that, that the way we look at things now is obviously superior to uh, the way things were looked at uh, at an earlier time. Uh, and he, uh, uh, in, in numerous places, uh, warns about uh, the assumption that, uh, that that we're always making progress in our understanding of, uh, of reality. Um, he, uh, in se again, in several places, including in that, in that uh, le uh, lecture. Uh, um, do you have a copy of that uh, lecture? That, that might be good, to, I was thinking to share with your students at some point, because I think it would be a good follow-up to this. Um, 
in that inaugural lecture, he, he asks, how is it that uh, what we used to describe as permanent, uh, things that we used to describe as permanent, uh, have now been uh, given the, what's he called, malodorous and malarial term stagnation. Um, how have we come to the point where we regard uh, things as being stagnant just because they're old? Well, in preparing for this, I, I came across an earlier development of his concern about stagnation, which I want to start with. Um, because I do want to talk about recovering something historically, uh, recovering a, an older view of reality, and a lot of people get nervous, so, oh, you're trying to turn back the clock. Well, this is, this is in a, an essay that he wrote in the early 40s called The Poison of Subjectivism, which is actually a 10-page sketch for the abolition of man, I think. Um, but he, he, he says how uh, people, um, people are upset that if, you try to if we tie ourselves to an immutable moral code, that we are cutting off progress and we acquiesce in stagnation. In other words, if we think there are permanent things which are always valuable, uh, that, that's to cut off progress. He says, let's strip it of illegitimate emotional power it derives from the word stagnation with its suggestion of puddles and mantled pools. If water stands too long, it stinks. To infer thence that whatever stands long must be unwholesome is to be the victim of metaphor. Space does not stink because it has preserved its three dimensions from the beginning. The square on the hypotenuse has not gone moldy by continuing to equal the sum of the squares on the other two sides. Love is not dishonored by constancy. And when we wash our hands, we are seeking stagnation and putting the clock back, artificially restoring our hands to the status quo in which they began the day and resisting the natural trend of events which would increase their dirtiness steadily from our birth to our death. For the emotive term stagnant, let us substitute the descriptive term permanent. Does a permanent moral standard preclude progress? On the contrary, except on the supposition of a changeless standard, progress if Im is impossible. If good is a fixed point, it is at least possible that we should get nearer and nearer to it. But if the terminus is as mobile as the train, how can the train progress towards it? Our ideas of the good may change, but they cannot change either for the better or the worse if there is no absolute and immutable good to which they can approximate or from which they can recede. We can go on getting a sum more and more nearly right only if the one perfectly right is right answer is stagnant. Now that serves two things. First of all, uh, justifies, I hope, in, in brief or very brief form, uh, our, our looking back and, and asking whether there's something uh, that, we, that we've lost, that we need to recover, but also introduces uh, uh, this large theme that I think undergirds Lewis's thinking about law and uh, about, uh, about government, uh, this theme of there being uh, an objective good. Uh, that is a, a theme that runs, as, as one author said, it's like a counter melody in almost everything Lewis wrote, his, his insistence on the objectivity of value. And, and I want to read a, a paragraph or two from Poison of Subjectivism in a moment to, to see how, he, how insistent he is on this. And this is, the, the, if you've read The Abolition of Man, you know that, that it begins with uh, his, his uh, concern about the, the loss of a conviction of the, of the idea that values can be rooted in reality in some way. Uh, Lewis was not, uh, that interested in politics, um, he was interested in the deep ideas that political debates uh, uh, refer to. I uh, didn't realize until I, again, I was preparing for this talk that uh, after Churchill was uh, uh, elected in 1951, uh, when, when the Conservative Party came back to power and, and Ch Churchill's party came back, uh, within a few weeks of, of Churchill's becoming prime minister again, uh, they offered uh, Lewis the uh, honorary title of Commander of the British Empire. I guess that would have made him Sir Clive. Uh, 